Hello, or I should say good evening, everybody. My name is Jacek Bartoszak. Welcome to Strategy in Future. And today my guest is uh, Tony Cowden. Hello, sir. Hello. Good to be with you. Thank you. Uh, Tony Cowden is a retired uh, U.S. Navy officer uh, who served in the Navy on the service combatants. Yes, that's that's correct. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, sir. And... Uh, 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 one of the uh, one of the ships he served on uh, is uh, USS uh, was USS Clark, which is not, should be known to the Polish uh, audience. So, uh, uh, b- 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 where he was an executive officer, right? So, second in command on the USS Clark, in the back in the nineties of the twentieth century. So, it's it's nice to uh, to host you, sir. Uh, so let's just get straight to the uh, to the most uh, quintessential question that everybody's asking these days. Uh, you know, the, the Navy officer, even a retired Navy officer. So what what is the uh, the regime? What is the what, what is going on in the maritime warfare uh, in the littoral waters of Eurasia in terms of the Black Sea in the war between Russia and Ukraine, where apparently Ukrainians are, you know damaging or sinking even big deck ships uh, of the Black Sea Fleet. So what's going on? Where are we in this competition between the uh, the, the, the coast or the shore, the, the, the fort, and the fleet that is trying to blockade the, the coast or impose its will or enable the amphibious uh, assault on the shore? Where are we in this balance sort of a power? Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And, and um, it's a, a very interesting time. <laughs> as the Chinese might say. But um, I would invite your listeners to uh, go back and read Julian Corbett's thoughts on the um, contest between a superior and an inferior fleet. And in the Black Sea, for example, the the Russians clearly have the superior fleet. Um, In fact, the Ukrainians have, at this point, no fleet. Corbett talks a lot about them. What happens in naval warfare is that the inferior fleet chooses not to come out and and fight the superior fleet uh, because it would be destroyed. Um, And so the goal of the (coughs) superior fleet in general is to find ways to get the inferior fleet to come out and fight. In this case, of course, the Ukrainians no longer have a fleet, so the Russians aren't challenged in trying to get them to come out and and fight. What the Russians are doing, for some reason, is continuing to quote unquote fight a fight a fort. And I think many of your readers would be familiar with the quote, often attributed to Admiral um, Nelson: "A ship's a fool to fight a fort because it's a very dangerous thing." Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I'm I'm writing an article this weekend about about this this topic. So the uh, Russians have lost a number of ships, some patrol boats, um, an LST in port, and of course the Moskva, and now apparently the Makarov um, to the Ukrainian actions. Um, the last two, apparently to anti-ship cruise missile attacks launched from shore. Um, the shore being in this case, quote unquote, the, the fort. Uh, It's a very challenging thing for fleets to fight a fort. Uh, What you typically want to do is take the fort away, um, and and, uh, you do that often by seizing the fort. The Russian army has been unable to continue along the Black Sea coast of Ukraine and deny uh, the coastline to the Ukrainians. And so the Ukrainians have been able to continue to employ uh, shore-launched anti-ship cruise missiles against Russian ships. Um, it really becomes an employment question of why the Russians are allowing ships to operate within a dangerous area without um, the scouting resources and the screening resources to protect the ships and why, of course, at the very, very tactical level of uh, anti-ship cruise missile versus a ship, why they're failing to defend against these cruise missiles. And at that point, I'll, I'll sort of stop and see uh, 
if we're going in the right direction with this conversation. Yes, you know exactly. I mean? That's that's exactly that's of course the uh, only the tip of the iceberg of this you know in the, the, the analysis, yeah, and there are many questions uh, in the year like uh, you know the, the Moskva was was sunk actually with allegedly only two cruise missiles, which you know uh, has nothing to do with uh, sort of the overwhelming salvo of 45 or 50, you know, that uh, also could be launched against a ship like that, uh, for example, in the war between US and China in the littoral waters of the Western Pacific, including the ballistic missiles and other, you know, missiles uh, or, you know, other munitions, set of munitions from other platforms. So where are we, in, in, you know, in this in this competition between the David and the Goliath, you know, in, in terms of the... Uh, the, 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 does the missile warfare change this calculus? You know that it, it, it changes the way the fleet should operate. Uh, if we could go more granular, our our audience knows uh, Corbett, his famous maritime strategy, Mahan, another great naval strategist, also Gorshkov, you know, and the uh, and Castex from France. So also those continental navalists that want to protect. The continent. <laughs> um, so we can go very granular in trying to describe how would you, as a you know a, a former navy navy officer, how would you get against the fort if you were a sort of this you know Russian officer or something like that? Let's 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 try to to, to think about it, you know, just or or even you can uh, make some hypothesis, you know, to defend or something. We, we let's 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 even speculate a little bit. Well, I think uh, Russia is um, making some strategic employment uh, mistakes in, in utilizing their superior fleet. Uh, they own the Black Sea. They can do a distant blockade of the Ukrainian ports, uh, the existing Ukrainian ports that they've not already seized, um, <clears throat> without endangering their ships. Why they're going into areas that they can be uh, mm -hmm. scouted and uh, targeted is um, not clear, uh, especially in the most recent case, uh, it appears that uh, 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 Makarov was within visual sight of Odessa. Um, that's really not particularly smart. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know why they're not employing a distant blockade and staying out of, of, of harm's way. Um, what they need to do well, they need to do that for one thing. And then they, if they want to eliminate that threat and use their, uh, bring their fleet in closer for whatever purposes, they're going to have to seize the the, the uh, shoreline and push back the anti-ship cruise missiles away from uh, the Black Sea. Okay, so one, one question is why are they aren't, have not just uh, uh, great, you know, I am, initiated the distant blockade. So what do you think? Why? Because they wanted really to have the amphibious assault or the sort of a show the presence and dominance? Or maybe they were thinking about using caliber missiles uh, against the land, but still they could do it from standoff positions. Yes. So what is, the, uh, what is your assessment in this particular case? So why? Well, as you point out, if uh, you know the uh, the the um, Grigorovich class frigate has caliber missiles, they but they have incredibly long range. They can they can launch those from anywhere in the Black Sea against Ukraine. Uh, so why they felt it necessary to bring it that close, I I really have no idea <laughs> what they're thinking. Um, it it uh, it just seems to be a serious employment mistake on their part. Um, especially if if the reports are true about the, the the attack on the frigate, yeah, I can sort of understand the the attack on the Moskva. It was I think sixty miles off the coast, which is quite a ways. Um, they may not have been aware of um, uh, either the Ukrainians' targeting ability or if the Ukrainians are getting intelligence from other sources. Um, they may not have been sensitive enough to that. Um, so there, there's some leeway there to say that, you know, that wasn't really an employment mistake as much it was a, as it was a failure at the more tactical level of the ship to be prepared to defend itself against an attack. Um, 
I just submitted an article, as a matter of fact, stepping through the uh, defensive capabilities of, say, the Grigorovich class frigate. And um, really, each, each incoming anti-ship cruise missile has to run a gauntlet of at least four defensive systems that each could have uh, either destroyed or, or decoyed or deflected or whatever uh, the missile. So why all of these systems are unable to do that when they are specifically designed to be able to do that suggests that um, the Russians aren't operating their ships very well. I understand. So the, 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 there is this sort of assumption that especially this frigate was quite modern. It had the proper systems to, to defend against such a small scale attack from not a sophisticated kind of a missile, subsonic, right? Not a very, you know, sophisticated missile, you know, but what could we say about uh, the situation if the Ukrainians had like 35 missiles of this type and some other munition from UAVs or some something else? that they could employ against such frigate. Would you say the same about this defensive capability? At, at, at one point, they, they would have been overwhelmed, wouldn't they? Yes. Um, in, in planning for such an attack, you, you really do want to um, make sure that you are able to overwhelm the planned defenses of, of the ship. Um, I wrote an article a couple of weeks ago looking at the Moskva attack and suggesting that on paper, from a planning perspective, the Ukrainians really didn't shoot enough missiles um, to uh, be assured that they could overcome all the defenses uh, of the of the uh, Moskva and hit it with enough combat power to to put it out of action. Um, as it turned out, they were able to put it out of action with only two missiles and it actually sink it, um, which suggests that. Again, Moskva did not employ their defensive capabilities uh, well enough. Um, yes, in, in general, you want to ensure that you're sending enough offensive combat power to overcome whatever the defenses are uh, that you think the, uh, the ship, the target can, can employ. You know, but, but building on what you have just said, do you think that we are about to face a similar situation that we faced one, 100 years ago, roughly speaking, where, you know, the dreadnoughts, the big uh, cruisers and the big battleships became very quickly quite obsolete by the uh, naval aviation, right? And, and uh, that seemed to be a little small and very fragile compared to those behemoths of steel. And, but they completely changed the, the way you, you did the, the naval warfare in terms of range and also precision and also, you know, the, the, the punch you know, that sent them almost, you know, to the, um, to the records of history, I mean, those ships. So do you think that we are entering, you know, not the same, but a similar paradigm change that, you know, you need to be twice more careful uh, being close to the shore because of the uh, missiles that are small, that can be fired from the forest or some mobile you know, launchers or even from the urban areas. So it's so difficult to preemptively knock them out and, uh, and they can really do harm, you know, in, in, in especially in terms of the cost and effect. And especially if, if you really fight against a formidable enemy, not like even Ukraine. So what does it say us? What do you think? What do you think in the U.S. Naval War College in, you know, you know, in Newport? What would be the lessons learned from this? Well, what you've identified is one of the, one of the really challenging aspects is, is trying to operate in a contested littoral environment. Um, there have been entire books written on um, uh, anti-axis aerial denial strategies, which is a very old tactic. Um, and anti-ship cruise missiles are just the latest, uh, or shore-launched anti-ship cruise missiles are just the latest technology. Um, mines have been used in the past, shore artillery, things like that, uh, air-based, um, uh, or rather land-based aircraft, et cetera, are all examples of 
you know, things that are designed to keep fleets away from your shore. <laughs> Anti-ship cruise missiles are just the latest one, and they're still one of, of, of many. Uh, but they are a particularly uh, challenging one, but you need to go back to the basics of fleet employment and screening, for example. Um, fleets do, do four things. They, they scout, they screen, they strike, and they base. And screening is really important. You want to make sure that the uh, shore-based anti-ship cruise missile battery can't get a fire control solution on you. They can't detect you or they detect uh, a decoy or they detect a less critical portion of your fleet. Um, so there are, there are ways to overcome the challenge, um, but it is a significant one. Yeah, you know, I, I have another question that that I, I'd like to, you know, uh, debate with you or even banter a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, U.S. Navy is known for not liking being close to the literal waters. You know, you're a, the, the, the Blue Ocean Navy, your combatants are designed to operate, you know, in freedom of operation maneuver far away from the coastal waters that are always, you know, skip very you know treacherous yeah for, for your ships so wh what is the mood among the uh, the u.s navy officers when they are forced by circumstance to operate in the narrow bodies of water like you know like the black sea or even worse in the uh, in the baltic sea for example or many literal seas of the western of the of asia so what, what what is this what is this modus of operandi? What is the way you operate? What is the mood? Uh, what are the procedures? You know, do you like going there, or there is a ban to go against you know through the Danish Straits, for example, for big ships? Uh, tell tell us more about it. What is what are the sayings? Maybe what are the proverbs or something among the you know U.S. Navy? Well, <laughs> the fault of of superior fleets is hubris, right? Um, and, and we would like everyone to fight the way we want them to fight because we're really good at that. And if you look at um, the British Navy in World War I in the North Sea, for example, it's very instructive because uh, they were continually frustrated because the German Navy wouldn't come out and fight them, you know, toe to toe, which is what, you know, the Royal Navy really, really wanted because that was their advantage. Um, you will hear, I think you've heard uh, mo a lot of senior U.S. Navy officers that, that love the idea of the Chinese Navy developing carrier strike groups yeah. because they would like a Chinese carrier strike group to come out and challenge us one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and of course, <laughs> because that's our strong suit. Uh, I'm hopeful that if faced with the Black Sea, the Baltic Sea, the South China Sea, uh, et cetera, that uh, wiser heads will prevail and will understand that there, uh, there are real dangers in going into denied areas. They're denied areas for a good reason, and they're challenging areas. Um, and you have to think more broadly than just, you know, fleet on fleet um, and, and, what your, and what your operational strengths are. Oh, yeah. And of course, uh, as I talk, I'm based in Warsaw, in Poland. Uh, you, rather, we are a country whose fate is being decided on land, in the land warfare, sure. not on, on the sea. And just uh, with full disclosure, I may say that uh, uh, our debate will be watched uh, carefully by many. But there is a major debate in Poland between the old school and the new school of thought. Uh, as uh, regards the procurement for the Polish Navy. So the old school wants to have, you know, the, the, the full squadron of frigates being deployed, bought, purchased, of course, and deployed uh, with specifications really amounting to the destroyer of the U.S. Navy. Uh, that, would, uh, that would sort of come up with the uh, air defense capabilities. That will also... Uh, augment the land-based air defense capabilities. And still the Baltics, and then of course there is a new school that is saying about a threat from shore, a threat from aviation, a threat from mines and torpedoes and many other things. And then those beautiful white elephants could be sunk quickly, just like you know the, the Russians 
ships are being in sequence of, uh, sunk by uh, uh, you know when engaged by by, by the Ukrainians. So uh, and it's, uh, given the fact that the, the Baltic is even a narrower body of water and a shallower body of water, and the shores are closer everywhere, much closer than in the Black Sea. And that the Russians, whatever we say about them, they are more sophisticated in terms of the, you know, missiles and the uh, anti-access capabilities than the Ukrainians. Um, you know, what is your net assessment of what we should be discussing? What should be the strategy of the Polish Navy? What, what's, how would you approach this this problem? Well, one uh, one reality of um, Naval combat uh, is that smaller, cheaper um, uh, naval vessels, which all, which necessarily have less defensive capabilities, uh, also make for for less appetizing targets uh, for the enemy. Um, they're also very valuable in screening more expensive, more capable. Uh, vessels. My my first ship, um, which I'll bring up here, was a very old guided missile destroyer, and uh, I had a relatively long career. So I was commissioned uh, well before the end of the Cold War, and we knew on an old guided missile destroyer that our role was to be out in front of the carrier, and if the Russian hordes came at us, uh, our role was to shoot down as many enemy bombers and anti-ship cruise missiles as possible and absorb as many as possible in order to protect the aircraft carrier or whatever it was we were we were escorting and guarding. Um, but I think you can you can do a similar thing with uh, manned and unmanned screening vessels um, on a guided missile destroyer protecting a carrier we're talking about a much larger order of magnitude of the problem. But if you're trying to, for example, move a uh, squadron of corvettes or frigates um, past Kaliningrad, for example, uh, you might be able to effectively screen them with unmanned air and surface vessels um, and let them get by. Uh, it, there, are, there are ways. Uh, but it's a challenge. And I do understand, you know, you have a limited budget, you have a limited number of large baskets you can, you can, you can buy. And it would be horrible if, uh, if they were destroyed very easily. Yeah. Yeah. I, I understand that you don't want to speculate in depth about it. Mm -hmm. If this is being a sensitive thing. But you know there are there are many 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 issues that you know. First, we need to think strategy. So, what objective you want to achieve? So, if you want to deny the sea, you don't need to have big ships, right? It's a, it's enough to employ employ capabilities from shore and from the air against the the shipping of the enemy. So it's good enough. Yeah? Uh, you agree with that? Yeah? If you if you simply want to augment the NATO capabilities of traversing the Baltic Sea. I wonder what sort of uh, help you would bring because the NATO is, as the name suggests, a North Atlantic <laughs> treaty organization, which is basically a, a Navy-based right. organization in terms of the United States being a naval power, a okay, predominant naval power in the world. So right. this connectivity be, uh, across the North Atlantic is the heart of it. So there are better guys with better equipment to really do it. Right. So, what what sort of assistance you are bringing to the table? I mean, irrelevant, yeah, yeah, to to the you know NATO sort of uh, composition of fleets, and also con I don't believe in convoying anything across the Baltic in in the hot war. So, I mean, the tankers or anything, and for sure, the Polish squadron of frigates would not be capable anyway to convoy anything. So in terms of strategic, I, I personally, it's a full disclosure, I tend to believe that the new school is better suited for the Polish future and we could spend this money on aviation, UAVs and robotic uh, capabilities or some sort of the, uh, some sort of the mosquito tactics, you know, employing 
low signature, low hull, uh, even unmanned or some manned, quite small combatants that don't need to have, you know, long longevity. And, uh, and you know, this, uh, what you see, worthiness, yeah, in, in English. Uh, and there should be many of them, right? Many of them to, so, to complicate the Russian planning and pre prevent amphibious landing or some sort of a blockade, yeah, or at right. least harass them. So that's the, that's it. I, I, would you try to, to comment on that or maybe? Right. Well, um, it's often good to to use a tactical situation or an operational requirement to focus your thought. There's been a lot of discussion, for example, in NATO, uh, if Russia, for example, um, uh, threatens the three Baltic states, how do we get forces there to, to help those states? And um, a lot of the focus has been on the land bridge through the Savalki Gap. Yeah. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to travel through the Savalki Gap in 2018. Um, very nice four-lane highway that passes through there to Lithuania from Poland. Um, but there's only one four-lane highway. And if there's a crisis going on, it's going to be easily interdicted and certainly swamped with refugees. Um, there's also a single, if I remember correctly, train line or train or rail line that goes into Lithuania. But Poland and Lithuania use two different uh, gauges of railroad lines. So it's not particularly convenient to move a lot of forces that way either. Um, so I, my personal opinion was um, it may be hard to move things by sea, but it's going to be much harder to move them by land. So if you need to get forces to the Baltic to support the Baltic states, rather, um, through, I think you have to consider moving them by sea. Well, that means going by Kaliningrad, which you, you pointed out is the modern equivalent of a fort. Uh, the Russians clearly have very strong uh, military forces and certainly uh, can launch anti-cruise missiles against seaborne forces uh, from Kaliningrad. So how do you move forces, whether they're Polish ships or NATO ships or whatever, um, necessary to, to reach uh, the Baltic states, you have to go by Kaliningrad. And I, I think you have to go back to uh, the basics. The number one way to defeat a fort that's protecting a coastline or a port or whatever is to either seize the fort uh, or destroy the fort. Um, seizing the fort usually in involves land forces. Well, it could take a while to, to seize the forts and, and you have to move things quickly. So then maybe that's not readily possible and it has its own challenges, right? Um, the other way is to destroy the fort. Well, if the fort is a mobile launcher of anti-ship cruise missiles, that's very hard to destroy because you can move them around, you can camouflage them, you can hide them, and there can be a number of them. And they could be anywhere uh, along the coastline or even um, some distance back from the coastline and still be able to threaten uh, ships moving in the Baltic. <clears throat> so naval forces alone are not going to be able to counter that threat. You'd have to blanket the peninsula with um, air strike forces as well as electronic uh, surveillance, et cetera, to uh, detect any threat and to try and neutralize it as you try and move forces. Then you wanna look again at the basics of fleet employment. And I talked earlier about screening. You're gonna to want to try and hide the um, major elements that you're trying to move uh, through the area and you're gonna to want to screen them with uh, decoy forces and screening forces that can help defend against any attack coming from the land and maybe absorb that attack. Um, just like I had to think about back in uh, the late 1980s. So that, that's sort of the basics of, of how to address the problem. Yeah, uh, but, but, but by the way, the, uh, the you served you served in the uh, in the eighties in the the Atlantic fleet fleets uh, 
you know, just or in the Pacific? Where where did you serve? Uh, Atlantic, uh, Mediterranean, and um, uh, off the coast of Norway. I so, never made it to the Baltic, unfortunately, <laughs> or the Black Sea. Why 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 didn't you make it to the Baltic? Oh, I I well, my ship uh, didn't get to go there. I really wanted to go there, um, but uh, I wasn't driving the ship back then. <laughs> <laughs> so it was not in the plans, yeah? It was not in the plans, no. Yeah. You know, I, I asked this specifically uh, because I wanted... So so, so you were exercising, you were get, getting ready for the... That was called outer sea battle or something, this concept of, you know, fighting off the, the Russians, keeping them at bay far away from the uh, aircraft carriers. It was called an outer sea battle or something like that. Yeah, yeah outer air battle, yeah. Outer air battle. Yeah. So... Uh, I understand. So that was already, you know, in the thinking, how to prevent, how to deny space so that the Russians could not employ their their cruise missiles, actually, and, and their bombers against the, uh, the the main main combatants, yeah, uh, already in the 80s. And the technology has changed, right, over the last 40 years. It's, it's getting more and more difficult, right? Yes, the flight profile of modern anti-ship cruise missiles like the, the Neptune is quite challenging. Neptune flies uh, very, very close to the uh, surface. It's very hard to detect um, at, any, at any range. Um, uh, the, the threat that uh, we were facing was, was generally was, was large uh, physically <laughs> and in effect. Um, but but easier to defend against. Uh, but the Russians have always believed in numbers, so um, it was it was really a question of uh, you know can you defend against all the all of the things that they can bring against you. So you know, th- saying about the numbers, let's focus now on the Western Pacific. Let's move away from you know the Russian threat. Let's talk about the Chinese threat. I'm sure you're thinking about it because this this comes. This goes big in terms of the numbers of the you know missiles and the salvo competition that could be employed against the uh, the surface yeah, combatants. Yes. There's a problem, of course, of the you know supplementing the inventory. You need to go to the port and stuff. So, how would you fight the Chi- the, the the Chinese shore, or you should, or we shouldn't, or the U.S. Navy shouldn't? You sh- should abandon the uh, air sea battle concept and uh, con- focus only on the defense defense minded you know offshore offshore balancing or some archipelago defense, you know, you, you name it, right? In the distant blockade. So what, what, what would you... Right. Okay. You are a supporter of which concept? To fight China, so to speak, and employing the Navy. <laughs> well, I'm not a big fan of going into the South China Sea quickly. Um, the uh, I would mention that historically, the anti-ship cruise missile was developed as an asymmetric uh, response to the superiority of things like carrier strike groups. And that's why... Because Russia, it was sort of the first, you know, manned, but still cruise missile, wasn't it? The Kamikaze, yes. Um, the Kamikaze was, was really the first um, anti-ship cruise missile, if you will. And there's a lot to be learned from looking at the Kamikaze uh, operations um unfortunately uh but um you know that that that's why the russians adopted the anti ship cruise missile so much more than the us navy did is because they saw it as an effective way to to uh, counter the aircraft carriers which they could not you know match a carrier strike group at sea directly um without them so um and and a lot of navies, including the Chinese Navy, have adopted you know small, fast, cheap uh, missile patrol boats that pack a lot of anti-ship cruise missiles and can deliver a lot of offensive combat power. They're not particularly good at defensive uh, combat power, um, but you can get a lot of anti-ship cruise missiles on a small, fast patrol boat, which is a real problem um, if you have enough of them. Uh, you mass them and you um, coordinate their attack, that can be a real problem um, for a group of of surface ships. The Chinese have invested a lot of technology and systems on trying to deny uh, the ability of the U.S. Navy to operate freely in the South China Sea. Um, 
anywhere within the, the let's say the first island chain. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a real challenge for the US Navy. If the US Navy was tasked tomorrow to prevent the Chinese from putting forces ashore in Taiwan, um, the, the worst thing they could probably do is send a carrier strike group straight into the South China Sea and try and have surface forces go in and, uh, and, and affect that. Um, there are things that the US Navy could do though with uh, um, screening and other strike forces uh, without putting them at significant danger. Um, and, and that's what I would recommend. So, the, the real, so you would keep them at you know at distance around Guam and elsewhere, so that they first of all you deal with the uh, with the Chinese threat by submarines and aviation or uh, uh, with other you know ways, right? Weaken them, soften them up, right, a little bit, and then just come big, yeah. So and you know you're talking the South China Sea, which is quite a passive body of water and also deep water, yeah. And it's much bigger, you know, looking at the map than the Black Sea or not to mention the, the, the right. Baltic Sea. And still, you are, you know, afraid to, to sail into those waters at the beginning of the conflict. Well, yeah, yes. Um, uh, I, 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 I prefer to talk about prudence than fear, though. <laughs> um, I understand. Fair enough. The Chinese have the opposite problem. Uh, they are absolutely hemmed in. Um, the U.S. Navy will shut down China's ability to move anything, any oil, any gas, any goods in or out of China or in or out of the first island chain within 24 hours. Um, China is going to be totally maritimely, if you will, um, isolated. isolated from the world immediately. Uh, whatever, you know, however the, the contest plays out between the, you know, uh, military forces, China is going to be cut off from the world uh, by sea immediately. And that's a huge strategic problem for China. Their economy cannot stand to be cut off uh, for any length of time. Um, they're not going to be able to feed their people for for very quickly, um, it would be a strategic disaster for them to go to war with the U.S. Unless, of course, they, they have the continental lines of communication with resources, not the maritime lines. Yeah. Well, one of, the, uh, one of the advantages of the maritime is buoyancy. Um, ships can carry... Volumes. Much, much more goods than, say, rail lines or trucks. Yeah. Um, I, I actually really became aware of this in studying um, Mexico at the Naval War College, uh, which seemed like a strange country to pick on as a student but or be assigned. Um, but you can have a single ship carry 10,000 containers from China to um, uh, the west coast of the U.S. in a week, okay? To move 10,000 containers across the Mexico border takes 10,000 people driving 10,000 trucks. Um, and it's just not as economically feasible to do that as it is to move um, that amount of goods by sea. Same thing with combat power. The combat power of a warship is gigantic compared to the equivalent combat power of, say, an army, a single warship. Um, so uh, there's a real advantage to uh, an economy of scale to moving things by sea. Um, yeah, the Belt and Road Initiative has roads and, and has rail, but we'll never be able to compete economically with moving the amount of goods that you can move by sea. The sea is critical. Yeah, I, I agree. But still, coming back to the you know the, the discussion about the mass concentration of mass and the precision, um, you know, don't you think that already introduction production of the torpedoes and patrol boats and you know and mines asymmetrically changed this old Nelson style? 
you know thinking that it's always you know the uh, the ship uh, the main ships that are the size of factors in the uh, in the warfare especially in the li- li- literal waters and uh, today the, the environment is becoming much more complicated with you know air uh, mines uh, rockets uh, <clears throat> electromagnetic also nuisance from the shore which is of no trivial importance right so uh, you know is it simply so that the you know the 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 the, 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 the big deck navy simply has to move away from the shore and fight in the open ocean more than it used to in the past or you know and with the lasers and other you know with all this technology that is changing this and precision uh, weapon technology so what what will be the evolution of the naval warfare in let's say within the next 50 years what do, what is your guess wow uh, well the 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 generic answer is the evolution of nor uh, naval warfare will evolve <laughs> um and uh predicting evolution is is really hard um but i think that the general answer is a, a solution will be found um but huge changes occur, right? I mean, the dinosaurs became extinct for a reason. <laughs> Battleships are no longer our capital ships for a reason. You know, evolution occurred. And, um, and, and there may be evolution that has large manned ships like aircraft carriers and destroyers and frigates um, become either obsolete or you have to operate them in radically different ways. Uh, I think we have a ways to go though. And um, if you look at, say, the history of the torpedo, uh, invented uh, the modern torpedo in what, the 1880s? Uh, You know, you had a a whole evolution of things to um, associated with the torpedo and then countering the torpedo, right? Destroyers were originally torpedo boat destroyers because you needed something to protect the cruisers, which were the scouts for the battleships um, from the torpedo boats, which could go out and, and, and cheaply sink a cruiser. And if the cruisers are sunk, the battleships won't have their eyes to find the other uh, battleships, the enemy battleships that they're trying to find. And then of course, um, if their screen is gone, they themselves are subject to attack by uh, torpedo boats. So you develop these torpedo boat destroyers to counter the torpedo boats. And so when those were countered, then you develop submarines that could launch torpedoes and you employed those. And then you had to develop the anti-submarine uh, warfare capabilities to try and detect and, and sink the submarines and, and on and on and on. Um, so there will be evolution. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to turn out. Um, the Russians are learning the very painful lesson uh, that um, you, you, you need to go back to the basics and not fight forts without adequate screening and employment considerations. Um, so I, I don't know if that answered your question, but... Uh, it's sort of, yeah. it, touches, it touches on it. I understand your diplomacy. And and uh, uh, maybe let me let me add this uh, ask uh, ask this question more in a more straightforward way. So, are you in this camp in the United States that you should reduce the numbers of the aircraft carriers in the in the Pacific, or and you know create a more versatile fleet with uh, you know the, the, the dispersed lethality? That's what you call, or you should still be a, you know a carrier force, so to speak, and uh, auxiliary elements helping the carrier force? Well, the, the U.S. Navy's role is to, is to fight the fight over there. Um, we need to be an expeditionary Navy that can carry the fight overseas. That's a different challenge than, than most navies have. Most navies don't have the worldwide national interest and commitments that the that the U.S. Navy is tasked with. Um, most navies are protecting their own uh, coastline or their local um, sea lanes, or they're in support of um, 
the U.S. Navy, like in NATO or whatever, in, in doing that on a global or wider scale. Uh, so the U.S. Navy is always going to be concerned about being able to take the fight far overseas. And that often involves projecting power ashore. And if you want to project power ashore, um, you need the ability to deliver combat power at great range um, and at a great recycle rate and with great accuracy. Um, aircraft carriers are, are particularly good at that. But as you point out, they often they require a significant amount of protection. And of course, countries that might be subject to uh, power projection from the U.S. Navy are trying to find asymmetric ways to keep carriers away from their shores. And, and that's the challenge. Um, I don't see a radical change in the U.S. Navy structure in the near future for decades. I think we're going to be committed to the aircraft carrier for a long, long time. And it may be that the forcing function for a major change is defeat um, or a clear <laughs> demonstration that you know carriers don't work anymore. I mean, this is what happened with battleships, right? Um, it was I'm clear- Thinking of Prince of Wales and you know the Japanese and stuff, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and uh, the U.S. Navy <laughs> was sort of forced into the decision very quickly because most of their battleships were sunk in, in Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. But as you point out, the British lost theirs to air power um, because they operated them without adequate air protection. And they, and they learned painfully that uh, you can't do that. So battleships immediately became integrated or soon became integrated with carrier strike groups and um, became one of two things until we had gained air superiority of, of an area, uh, they became air defense for the aircraft carriers. And then later they became shore bombardment uh, in support of sending forces ashore on the various islands in the Pacific, for example. Mm -hmm. was it, so the, but there was a painful transition there uh, more painful for the Royal Navy, I guess, um, uh, in, in learning those lessons and in changing that that uh, modus operandi. Yeah, that is true. And okay, unfortunately, so you know, uh, combat is the most effective teacher of lessons, and you often don't um, see these lessons coming until you experience them. Um, I'm a big fan of the book, um, uh, Neptune's Inferno, the mm -hmm. story of the uh, Battle of Guadalcanal, uh, the Naval Battle of Guadalcanal. Um, the Marines uh, will complain to this day that, that we abandoned them on the shores of Guadalcanal. But the fact of the matter is, is that three times as many sailors as ground uh, troops died uh, in the U.S. forces in the Battle of Guadalcanal. And that was because the U.S. Navy thought it knew how to fight. Uh, it had advanced technologies like radar or fire control uh, available to them, but they didn't know how to employ them. Um, and, um, and they had to learn some very, very painful lessons on how to fight at sea. And they learned that the Japanese had developed weapons and tactics like their long length torpedo and night fighting tactics um, that were far superior to what the, the Navy was prepared to do. Our U.S. Navy. Yeah, yeah, I remember this exactly. This this fight on the shores, at the shores of the Guadalcanal. That uh, and it was still early in the war, so the fate of war was not decided yet at the time. And there were many in the US, Japanese Navy that thought that the, the war was won, you know, for Japan. Yeah. A, a friend of mine, um, a retired uh, um, Navy admiral pointed out to me that, you know, uh, in his meeting with his counterparts in the Army and the Air Force, but especially the Army and the Marine Corps, is that because of Afghanistan and Iraq, um, the ground forces, U.S. ground forces, had done a lot of painful lesson learning. <laughs> they weren't prepared to fight um, insurgency type and guerrilla type actions. They had to learn how to do it. 
Um, the U.S. Navy, you know, hasn't fought anybody since World War II, really. Um, not really in fleet to fleet engagements. Yeah. Um, and we have a real challenge, I think, to understand uh, how things have evolved and um, and how we might perform, you know, fleet on fleet. Um, or against uh, a asymmetric foe that an inferior fleet that uh, has learned how to fight effectively asymmetrically. Yeah, it, it's nothing you know rare in the history of naval warfare uh, because you know uh, as I understand the naval battle is so decisive and force attrition that everybody's just avoiding it, and once you are dominant at sea, nobody wants to confront you. So the Royal Navy had the same thing, you know, between the Trafalgar and the escape flow and the uh, uh, Utland battle. Actually, with a few exceptions, you know, during the Crimean War, but it was of no match. You know, the uh, there was no uh, battle, yeah, naval battle for one hundred years. You know, yes, so maybe... I, I'm I'm sure you've read uh, Andrew Gordon's uh, The Rules of the Game. Um, mm -hmm was for a while there very popular in the U.S. Navy. I hope everyone's still reading it because it describes what the U.S. Navy is facing. Um, as you point out, you know, from Trafalgar to Jutland uh, for 100 years, that no one challenged the Royal Navy and they hadn't had to fight fleet on fleet. And they didn't perform as well as expected uh, when Jutland came around. And um, uh, they... The, the navies and the technologies had transformed immensely, <laughs> immensely in that hundred years. Yeah. Well, it's been 70 some years, 80 years since, uh, almost 80 years since uh, the end of World War II. And um, there, the technologies have changed, tactics have changed, the threat has changed, and we would be well warned to think about that some more. Everything is changing, and exactly at strategy and future, we think about what change is bringing as we try to forecast the future. And I don't want to, you know, be too grim, but I think that the United States Navy is going to face a war in the Western Pacific uh, before this 100 years uh, will have passed between, you know, let's say, Iwo Jima and this new, conf you know, new engagement. Uh, or at least there is a high probability that this would happen. So I hope that you guys there, there are getting ready for it. We are watching it closely from, you know, from Eurasia, as the fate of Eurasia is, is uh, hanging upon you having access to us and controlling the sea lines of communication and so on. So what, one thing I'd like to caution is... Um, Going back, going back now to uh, the the Black Sea and Russia's performances is, is overlearning lessons from their tactical failures. Um, both the Moskva and the, uh, especially the uh, 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 Makarov, uh, should have been able to defeat uh, one or two anti ship cruise missiles fired at them. Uh, the systems they had were designed to defeat those. And uh, if they were fully operational and manned by competent operators, um, there's every likelihood they should have been able to defeat a two missile attack uh, on those ships. Uh, so I really, I really caution taking too many lessons that say that you know all surface ships are are, are uh, uh, now obsolete because of what we've seen with the Russians. I think we have to factor in the Russians are not employing their fleet well and they're not operating their fleet well. Uh, that, I think that's very clear. That might be so. That might be. They, they have never been a good you know, naval sea people, so to speak. They, they were always a continental power, having land army, and they were usually poor at the Navy operations. And that's another argument you know, for our Navy, so against whom, actually. And especially if Finland and Sweden were to join NATO, the Baltic Sea would become an inland inland lake of the NATO. Right. So, uh, again, in my modest opinion, the uh, investment in the in the surface combatant, combatant would be even less needed for Poland. Mm -hmm. in that case. 
Right. It, well, in the starting point, it, w- it was interesting. Um, I, I had a chance to visit Poland, Lithuania, and Belarus in, in uh, the spring of 2018 and uh, talked to a, a number of senior um, defense and, and uh, official security officials in all three countries. And I was surprised uh, by the lack of focus on the Baltic Sea, even in Lithuania. <laughs> what we consider to be a Baltic nation, uh, there was no discussion by senior defense officials about what the Baltic Sea meant to them. Um, from my perspective, I talked earlier about the challenge of NATO helping out the Baltic nations. The Baltic Sea is critical uh, to the security of, of Lithuania, for example. And so I would ask, um, because I didn't get an answer from, from anyone I talked to in Poland at the time, what, you know, what does Poland think about the strategic importance of the Baltic? What do you want to be using it for um, in times of crisis? Um, I gave an earlier example of, uh, you know, supporting the Baltic nations given some Russian transgression over there, but that's that's sort of a separate, that's their strategic issue. So I think the starting point would be uh, for me, if I were uh, thinking about the Poland's problem is what do we want to be able to to use the Baltic for what does it mean to us strategically, and then what kind of forces do we need, naval, air, et cetera, um, to ensure that? Yeah. So this is a lesson that we need to learn in Poland and think about it properly. Mm-hmm. Right. I gave the example of the U.S. Navy. Our um, role is to take the fight over there. We're not designed to protect New Jersey and California. Um, We're designed to project forces into the Mediterranean, the Baltic, the North Sea, the Norwegian Sea, uh, the South China Sea, West Philippine Sea, wherever. Uh, Wherever our nation calls us to, says it has interests, that's where we're we're designed to go. Um, And that's, and like I said, that's different than most navies. So I would, you know, I would focus on, well, you know, what does the Baltic mean to us strategically and, and how do we want to use it? And then what capabilities do we need to ensure that? Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Our guest today was um, uh, a retired US, U.S. Navy officer, Tony Coden. Uh, and you stay with us for more episodes of Strategy in Future. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was, a, it was fun. <laughs>